Great. It's nice to see you. <laughs> it's, it's been long. Nice. We've been, chatting up, we've been chatting up and I think after the first po podcast recording, I just kind of feel like it's been great to have you, to know you. Um, you know, your team does an amazing job, but like still just to have access to you, it's just always that much more peaceful, you know. So thank you so much for that. Anytime, anytime. Um, you know, we, we understand that people like yourselves and, and many other clients place tremendous trust in us by placing your digital assets with us. So the, the, anything that we can do to make you feel more comfortable, it's it's all it's it's basically always our pleasure. Opa. Okay, let's plus get started. Plus you're, a <laughs> you're a fantastic guy too, so it's fun to chat. No, absolutely. I kind of feel like we built a relationship after the first podcast, you know, so that's great. Hopefully we bump into each other sometime soon, just exactly in opposite parts of the world. <laughs> but we will, we will. Bitcoin is a very global uh, thing and I'm sure we're going to run into each other. I, I, as I mentioned, a bunch of our team is going to be in Singapore. Unfortunately, I'm not making it this year because I'm heading over to yeah. Bogota and, and LATAM. But next year or at some point, I'm sure we're going to connect. Super. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get started. You're the first guest with a second time appearance on 21 Tars. So thank you so much for coming back. That's a tremendous uh uh, pride. I'm very proud of that. So thank you for having me on again. Um, but the first podcast episode was great. Um, I think the most interesting thing was really one of the most fascinating backgrounds of a founder uh, getting involved in Bitco Bit in Bitcoin and starting a a Bitcoin business. Because it's the second episode for those for those of you in the audience who want to know Mauricio's background, I would recommend that you watch its podcast episode number 37, which we did in March 2023. Uh, but for people who are listening for the first time, Mauricio, please tell, uh, give us a little background about uh, Ledin and what does Ledin do? Sure, uh, absolutely. So Ledin is a company who our flagship product is issuing dollar loans backed by Bitcoin. And this is to provide liquidity to people that need cash but don't want to sell their Bitcoin. So that is our flagship product. We've been issuing these loans since 2018. And because that was our first product and people could come to us and place their Bitcoin as collateral to borrow dollars, very quickly they started asking us for additional services. So the, the next big request we got was to provide interest or yield on your Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And so that's what created, or that's why we created the Bitcoin savings account, which is now the Bitcoin growth account. And I'll explain why that transition is so important. Uh, and, and I think a key to rebuilding the lending industry, but we offer loads backed by your Bitcoin interest or yield for your Bitcoin, also dollar uh, interest or yield for your US dollar stable coins or US dollars in the case of prime loans. So this is a product where clients lend us dollars and they get interest. So for context today, that rate is 9% on dollars and it's 1% on Bitcoin. And the rate to borrow dollars backed by Bitcoin is 12.9%. So very clearly you can see we borrow dollars at nine, we lend dollars at 12.9. That's the spread. That's how Ledin makes money to operate. And then similarly on the Bitcoin side, people lend us Bitcoin at 1%. We then relend that Bitcoin at a higher interest rate and we take the difference. So that's how Ledin operates and makes money. In addition to those services, we also have the ability to trade. So if you have the USDC on our platform, you can basically trade that into Bitcoin and out vice versa. And we have our B2X loan, which is a loan to buy more Bitcoin, which we saw a lot of our clients start doing once we launched the first Bitcoin back loan, the traditional Bitcoin back loan. And then another very recent product is another uh, way of earning yield on your Bitcoin and your dollars. And that is a dual cryptocurrency note, which is a uh, product that works on pairs. So you can start with dollars, basically plan a future purchase of Bitcoin. And depending on the price and the date at which the dual cryptocurrency note matures, you would either get back dollars or Bitcoin. Bitcoin. That's what's called a dual cryptocurrency note. And that product lets you earn interest on either Bitcoin or dollars, or sorry, yield on Bitcoin or dollars. And the outcome basically is, or the difference between that and the growth account is that you deposit Bitcoin and you may get dollars at the end of the term. Similarly, if you deposit dollars, you may get Bitcoin at the end of the term, but you will always be earning a higher yield on the dual cryptocurrency note versus the growth account. But we can go over those two products in detail because those are the, the newest ones. And I think they're very, very unique uh, and important that we go through the the nuance uh, of what makes each product unique. I rose off uh, launches and uh, you guys have definitely been building in the Bitcoin bear market. Um, so the first products by Ledin, but the title of the podcast episode that we did in March was the last crypto lending platforms standing. So of course you guys came on the podcast when crazy stuff was happening. I think almost all the lending platforms have gone out of the market, some really big ones. 
Um, a couple of them were, you know, much bigger than you guys, but you guys stayed in the market. What's what's been happening since then? How have you? What, what's the competition like? Um, are you still uh, the last crypto lending platform standing? Uh, how how has the crypto lending industry evolved since March? So. As you mentioned, we are, I believe, the last crypto lender standing, if not the last one of the last uh, standing. And a, a reason or I think a testament as to why we're here today is because we've been doing what we said we would. From very early on, we've invested heavily on transparency. So we were the first uh, lending company in the crypto industry to do a proof of reserves attestation, which we still do them today. Uh, since uh, so far this year, uh, I, I'll kind of highlight some of the main uh, things that we've done. So the, the main one is we've continued with our proof of reserves attestation. Another one is scheduled very little. A few weeks, uh, you should be seeing another proof of reserves attestation come. Those get redone every single six months. And importantly, this is an exercise where a public accounting firm comes to let and verifies the liabilities that we have on behalf of our clients, verifies the assets that we have in custody exchanges, lending relationships, ensures that we have more than enough assets to cover our liabilities. And that report gets produced and available. It gets made available for our clients to check. They can even check that we reported the correct balance to the accountant on the day of the attestation. So that's very important as part of our DNA. And that's something that's going to continue. Uh, since then, this year, we also introduced what's called the open book report. And the open book report is just one more tool for clients to better understand how we utilize the assets at Ledin to generate the interest that we pay for our products and also how we make the products uh, exist. So where we get the funding for the loans, et cetera. So in this report, which gets published monthly, you can see how Ledin is using the USDC assets on our platform. So today, just to paint a picture, 93% of all of our USDC assets are being used to finance our Bitcoin back loan uh, book, which is back two to one by Bitcoin. And the 7% that's not doing that, it's sitting in custody and, and banks for operational purposes only. Then on the Bitcoin side, you, we also show you how, how much of the Bitcoin is lent and to whom to generate that interest. And we also break down the Bitcoin collateral for the loans where that is being held, whether if it's in custody or it's being pledged to another institution to get additional fund. So all that stuff is visible now on the open book report. Um, the next thing that we did is we announced that we received our Cayman virtual service, virtual asset service provider registration. We were the first lender to get this. I believe we're one of the last companies that has gotten this. That's something that makes us very proud, especially with so much uh, happening in the regulatory front so far this year. We're, we're very happy to have gotten that. And then the additional thing that we have, well, in addition to all of those things, we've launched brand new products. So one of them being our dual cryptocurrency notes, which again, gives clients one more option to earn yield on their Bitcoin or USDC. That is a different type of yield than from lending. It's a different uh, service offering. And in addition to that, we have now uh, completed the transition from our Bitcoin savings account to what we call the Bitcoin growth account. And this is a very important important change, even though to many people, it might just look like the, the name has changed. The legal and technical differences between the two products in the back end have a materially superior risk profile, uh, both for clients and for the business. So I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. But this is, I think, an evolution that's going to reshape the lending industry going forward, because I believe this is the more sustainable and responsible way of offering yield on Bitcoin. You guys definitely know what reshaping the lending industry means. So you 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 came on the podcast because you had a couple of important announcements to make. So let's let's get that going first. What are the announcements? Exciting announcements that Leiden has to make, and then we can cover some of the things that you just mentioned. Definitely. So since I was on the pod last time, since March, we've shipped two new products. One is your dual cryptocurrency notes, which I can I just touched on briefly, but it's a brand new product for clients to earn yield on Lenin. Again, different type of yield from lending and it offers you a higher yield than our growth accounts. So that product, uh, I can explain in a second, but I'll, I'll kind of go through a quick summary of the two announcements, and then we can go into detail on each. And the one I just mentioned recently now is the transition from our Bitcoin savings account to our Bitcoin growth account, which was completed last week. And again, uh, there are big improvements in terms of legal and technical differences on how these products uh, or how, how this uh, a Bitcoin growth account is offered vis-a-vis -vis the previous model, which I think are, uh, to us, it's the blueprint or can be the blueprint over which a respond responsible Bitcoin lending ecosystem can be built. So which, whichever one you want to touch on first, I'm happy to go into more detail. Let's go with the growth account, um, the, you know, the new experience, uh, the transition into a new format. Definitely. So before the, uh, in the past, the lending industry 
had very little ring fencing of risks uh, within lending activities within each company's operations. So as an example, if you were a client that had, say, a Bitcoin back loan with a platform like Celsius, your Bitcoin back loan is now unaccessible because of the risks that they took with their yield product. So that, in effect, uh, because a company had a loan that went sour or several loans that went sour on this uh, on their interest or yield offering, the, the entire company went bankrupt. And that captured everybody that was trying to earn interest and was not trying to earn interest. Everybody that had any type of relationship with this company has now has their assets trapped. And what that means is that there's no legal ring fencing between or, or technical risk ring fencing between the people that were in there wanting to take risk to earn that yield versus the people that didn't necessarily want to opt into that risk to take that yield. So what the new growth account does is that it ring fences the risks of the growth accounts lending operations, both technically and legally. So what does that mean? When you come to Ledin now and you send assets into Ledin, they are going to land into what's called a Bitcoin transaction account. The Bitcoin transaction account, the assets are primarily held in custody. They are not being lent. And therefore, it is not exposed to the, to the lending risks of any loans issued for people participating in the growth account. So when you send assets to Ledin, you can now choose between staying in the transaction account where your assets, again, are held primarily in cold storage and they are not at risk of any lending activities being done from the growth account pool of assets. Or you can opt in to participate in the growth account and therefore transfer your assets from your transaction account to your growth account. Once your assets are in the growth account, they will now only be exposed to the benefits and risks of the loans issued out of the growth account. So what does that mean? It means that if once your assets are in the growth account, you are only facing the benefits and risks of the loans issued out of that account. You are now no longer impacted by lead and bankruptcy risk. So if Lenin were to go bankrupt at a corporate level and your assets were in the growth account, your assets would not be impacted. Conversely, if you are a person that has your assets in the Bitcoin transaction account and one of the institutional loans that has been issued from the growth account pool of assets gets impaired, that impairment will basically then get distributed among the participants in the pool assets and will not impact the person that is participating in the transaction account, if that makes sense. So all this is doing is effectively ring fencing the benefits and risks of the growth account activity to those who choose to participate in it. And those who choose not to participate in it are also ring friends from the risks of the loans issued out of the growth account. So what this ensures is that if somebody is at lead end and participating in the transaction account, they do not want to take on the risk or the benefits to earn interest, they will just keep their assets in the transaction account. And if, God forbid, there was any issue with one of the institutional loans on the growth account, that person with the assets in the transaction account would not be impacted. And then again, the opposite of that is if there's any issue on corporate lending for any particular reason, the people with assets in the, trans in the growth account would not be impacted by any issues at a corporate level. So that is something that makes, I believe, the offering much superior for our clients. It eliminates this uh, potential or minimizes the potential of binary outcomes where you either get nothing or get everything and ensures that you're always having access to the, uh, the highest uh, percentage of your assets or the highest amount of your assets that you possibly can while ensuring that any type of recovery will be managed only with that asset that was impaired, with a portion of assets that was impaired. So again, I think this is going to... I just want to understand the lending platform. Uh, you know, um, the the risk typically exists in the lending business, right? In the transaction business, the Bitcoin are in cold storage. So that gets ring-fenced, actually. So if somebody wants to use lead-in just for transactions and does not want to access the growth or the yield part of the business, that's ring-fenced, correct? Correct. So the, the risks and benefits of all the lending activity that's happening out of the yeah. growth account pools is, is ring fence to the people participating in those pools. So if you are a person that is participating on the Latin Bitcoin back loan, what you are going to want to see is the Bitcoin back loan open book report section, where it shows you how much of your Bitcoin collateral is in custody, how much of that Bitcoin collateral has been pledged to another entity to get funding for our Bitcoin back loans. But again, those will be managed in a separate and distinct group or pool than the ones from the growth account. And the way you've managed to do that is internally and legally seg segregating these products, right? Because otherwise at a corporate level, uh, so there must be legal uh, language 
which when I give you Bitcoin and put it in a transaction account uh, and whatever the agreements or, you know, documents that I signed off, internally, legally, you're providing that safety. That, that is correct. So when you read the terms and conditions of both of the accounts, you will see that they are different entities that you're interacting with when you move over to the growth account or when you stay in the transaction account uh, in the oh, future. You, when so you... you've actually created separate entities. Correct. So they are separate legal entities that offer these products. And, and again, once you use these products, when you are in the process of accepting and reading the terms and conditions, you will see that, for example, when you're facing the growth account, you will be moving assets over to a different entity. And that is what creates both the legal and technical ring fencing of the risk. Great. That's that's fantastic. Uh, I just wanted to show uh, the um, audience, um, just sharing this uh, screen, anything else that you want to talk about uh, from the website, Mauricio? So or you've I, covered will, everything. No, what I will mention is the first one, the first transition on this account was the Bitcoin uh, growth account. So that's been that's already live in the market. Again, if you are in the Bitcoin uh, growth account, you are now in this in this new service that I just mentioned. Uh, if you were if you were a, uh, a Ledin client that had assets in the Bitcoin savings account, they have been automatically transferred to the growth account, and you you do have the option right now to transfer it out back to the transaction account if that's what you prefer. But that product is live in the market today. And the growth account for Bitcoin, if you log in, you will see that you now have two accounts for Bitcoin, one transaction account and one growth account. Now, on September 6th, this same change will be happening to our USDC savings account. And on September 6th, we will also be introducing a Tether uh, transaction account and a Tether growth account. So that is uh, an exciting nugget that I'll share here. But you'll be seeing the same uh, type of, of uh, announcements very soon for both the um, USDC uh, savings account as well as our new Tether, so not savings account, growth account, and our new Tether growth account and transaction account. So those will be all coming in just a matter of weeks. Fantastic. Um, I think I've always struggled to use a lending platform just as a custodian, like, you know, when you want to transact, just because of the risk, because I don't want to expose myself to the risk of the lending business. So now if you do not want to do that, you can still end up using the same entity. So that's that's great. You guys have done a lot of firsts, like the proof of reserves, uh, um, and I think the open book kind of process, I've never really heard this, uh, and I don't know if you have time, we can maybe go a little deeper into it. So uh, congratulations for another First, I think at an institutional level, I know a couple of people do this. I think NIDIC does this. Um, but at a retail level, to kind of have that possibility is fantastic. And I I'm sure, I, I, th I think I really like you guys because you truly think of risk all the time. I automatically get risk all the time. And of course, with lending, there is a sort of, there is a risk. It's, you know, but um, at least you are not getting involved into a product without knowing the risk. Uh, and that's fantastic. And yes, and thank you for saying that. And and I believe what you've said is is spot on in 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 a couple of ways. One is we understand that because we're a lending company and we have other services, some people may not want to be exposed to the risks of our lending activities. They want that risk to be ring fenced only to be distributed and shared amongst the people that are willingly coming in and taking making that decision to participate in those accounts. So that's why we wanted to go ahead and provide that that solution so that clients could participate and choose the products and the risks that they want to participate in when they're dealing with Letit and not necessarily automatically being, you know, handed back all the risks of all of our products just because they want to use one particular service. So that was something very important for us and and you you're going to see us continue to work to progressively ring fence the as many risks that we can uh, in the business going forward. And uh, the second one you said, I'd love to spend a minute to talk about yeah. the open book report. Uh, I'd be happy to share my screen if if that works. Wonderful, perfect. Okay, so what's this? Uh, yeah, so just to walk you through this. So this is our Lenin open book report for the month of August. And as you will see, as I walk you through this, it provides details on the current utilization of both our USDC and our Bitcoin assets so that our clients can understand how we generate interest for our growth accounts and we can offer the interest rates that we do for our loans. So I'll, I'll skip over the forward word. Most people can read it in their own time. Uh, what, it key, what key is here is this is the use of funds for USDC. So as you'll see, the USDC assets at Lenin are largely being used to finance our Bitcoin back loan, a retail Bitcoin back loan book. So 92.6% of the USDC is financing those Bitcoin backs, uh, Bitcoin back loans right now. 
these are loans that our clients come to uh, our platform to place two to one Bitcoin collateral to borrow dollars for whatever they, the liquidity needs they may have. So as you will see here, the 7.4% of the USCC is being held at custody or banks, and that's strictly for operational purposes. So the yield in these accounts is being generated basically only by financing our Bitcoin back loan books at this time. On the Bitcoin uh, funds breakdown, you'll see that we are breaking down two, uh, two types of uh, uh, Bitcoin here. One is the Bitcoin growth account assets. So these are the people that have opted to participate in the Bitcoin growth account to generate yield. You'll see that 73.6% of that Bitcoin is in custody. Uh, again, we're still taking a very conservative approach to the Bitcoin lending market. 26.4 is out uh, generating interest and that is reflected in our rate. So as you'll see in the Bitcoin side of the house, we have almost 74% of the Bitcoin in custody and that is largely reflected in our interest rate. This is why we're offering only 1% yield on Bitcoin. And again, here you see the utilization ratio on the USDC is very high and that's what allows us to pay that 9% on that USDC savings account soon to be the growth account. For the retail loan collateral Bitcoin, you will see that 81.4 of that Bitcoin is in custody. 18.6 is with high quality institutions. And again, largely that is to get uh, uh, for Lenin to get an institutional size Bitcoin back loan in dollars so that we can get the dollars we need to fund the dollar demand for retail Bitcoin back loans that we get. And so this is the breakdown here on the Bitcoin. Um, and again, this is just uh, singling out the Bitcoin growth account. This is singling out the Bitcoin loan collateral. And this here further breaks down the collateralization ratio of our lending for our US dollar loan book. So as you see, as you will see, 100% of the loans that we are financing with our, the USDC are collateralized with Bitcoin. And, and the collateral ratio on those loans is 251.5% Bitcoin to dollars. As you will see here further, there that means that there are 0% uncollateralized loans uh, that have been issued from the USDC assets. And then after here, it, it basically walks you through our risk management policies, some of the highlights for people to, to follow. But this is produced monthly. We are working to have this be updated in real time on our clients' dashboard. Uh, right now, you will see the breakdowns in your dashboard. But again, it's getting updated once a month. We're working to have this get updated in real time. So that is the open book report in a nutshell. That's great. That's really great. I, it also kind of shows that you can do the... Um, you know, the conservative stuff in Bitcoin lending and still build a, you know, great business out of it. There's a demand out of it rather than doing all the risky things, which, you know, all the other lending platforms did. The Bitcoin Bitcoin users like me need a lending platform out there so that we don't have to sell our Bitcoin, you know, so that's fantastic. Go ahead. No, that, that I, I appreciate the kind words. And, and like you said, you know, we we built this business in the very early days to solve our own problem. We needed a Bitcoin back loan. Nobody would give it to us. So what when we went out to build this, we said, what do we as responsible adults want to see out of a service provider so that we can feel comfortable giving them our assets, either for collateral or to generate interest? And in many ways, we continue to build Ledin and update this by adding the things that we would want to see to make us feel comfortable to interact with a platform that offers this type of services, especially in the context of what we of the market that we were just that we just came from. We've always been sort of a a transparency first. Uh, you know, we were investing in proof of reserves when people were adding hundreds of tokens, so we were always seen as the boring Canadians. Um, you know, it was it was hard to push transparency and responsibility back in the hype of the 2021 cycle when everybody just wanted that extra yield. It was very hard to have a conversation with somebody when we were trying to say why you should use Lenin because it's less risky. And that just meant that they so they just saw a lower interest rate. They didn't really care that it was less risky. They just saw less interest. I want to go the highest and the highest. And we, we kept saying, you know, ask the right questions. How, what, what is their risk management policy like? What, how are they generating this, in, this interest? We can tell you always where are nine that we're paying on USDC comes from or where the one that we're paying on Bitcoin comes from. Pretty simple answer. And if you can't really explain that, um, then that, that should be a flag for you. Uh, so again, you know, it, it's great to hear that the work that we do to, to make the business even more transparent, even more sound uh, resonates with, with people like, your, like yourselves. Well, I guess it's reflected in your numbers, but let's move on to the um, second product, uh, the dual uh, currency note. Do you want yeah. me to share my screen or do you want to share yours? Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. If you don't, you can share it. We're going to share the same, the same, the, the same, uh, website. Perfect. So this is the dual cryptocurrency note product. And what this product does is that it allows you to plan a potential future purchase of or sale of Bitcoin at a particular time in the future at a particular price in the future. So you can it's, select. So it's a bit like options, but I think you've dumbed down the language so that regular people who are not traders um, can understand this product, right? It's a product, yeah. So in 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 some ways, it it basically you you can set the the outcomes can reflect that of the options market. Like you mentioned, the process itself is much simpler. It's been completely sort of uh, designed in a way that the client doesn't have to worry about anything. A client just picks a date that they would be happy selling their Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin at, and a price that they would be happy either buying or selling Bitcoin at. And basically, we take care of all the rest. We pay a client a yield or a, a, we believe to be an excellent yield for for that commitment. And then at the end of the term, at the end of the uh, period that the client selected, if the price is at or above the price the client wanted to sell, the client will get Bitcoin instead of dollars or dollars instead of Bitcoin. If the price of Bitcoin is below the price that the client wanted, they will get Bitcoin instead of dollars. So that might be a bit confusing. So let me give you an example. The best way to do this is with an example. Oh, you have them on the screen. So that's perfect. So let's just say you are a person that has Bitcoin and would be a happy seller of that Bitcoin at say $40,000 for argument's sake. So you will log on to the platform. You will select the Bitcoin to dollar pair because you're starting out with Bitcoin. And at that point, you will select how much Bitcoin. So let's just say it's one Bitcoin. You put one Bitcoin as a transaction amount. Then you select what date in the future you would be happy to sell the Bitcoin. So let's just pick for argument's sake, end of September. So one month or two months uh, starting today. And then let's just say that you will be a, um, and what that will do is it'll spit out a yield that you will get. So once you select the amount, the price and the date, you will see what yield you're going to get for committing to that DCN. So the yield, let's just say for argument's sake, it's 0 0.02, 0.02 Bitcoin, just for argument's sake. Um, what's going to happen is once that DCN is set up, your one Bitcoin is going to get locked up into that DCN. Time is going to go on until the end of September. So that at the end of September, if Bitcoin is at, say, $41,000 above the price you want, you will be getting $40,000 back because your Bitcoin will be sold at 40 as you desired. You'll get $40,000 back at the end of that term, plus the 0 0.02 Bitcoin yield that you received for being for participating in that. Project. Let's just say for argument's sake that the price of Bitcoin didn't get to above 40K. It just started, it stayed at 38 and then and finished the month of September at 38. Well, then because your sale price was not met, you get back the exact same Bitcoin that you put into the contract. Plus the 0 0.02 Bitcoin yield. So you're always going to get the yield regardless of the outcome. What may, what may be different is you either get the asset that you put in or you get the converted asset at the price you wanted at that time. And so that is if you start with Bitcoin and you are a happy seller at 40, you can do a, a Bitcoin to dollar pair. But the same applies... So, so, so sorry. So just um, the benefit over here is that um, either you get the price that you want. So... so so what you can lose is the potential upside. So rather than 40, rather than 41, you still get 40. But for the risk of losing upside above um, your the, above the price that you were happy with, you get the yield. You nailed it on the head. That's that's yeah. absolutely it. And yeah. and that is effectively where your yield comes from. Is because yeah. that that potential somebody's willing to give that correct. And, and just yes. so that we're very clear. The counterparty for your DCNs is always leaded. So when you submit a DCN, the yield is coming from leaded. And the reason we are the participants or, or happy to be on the other side is because leaded is constantly buying and selling Bitcoin. So these, these uh, agreements, these pledges from our clients have value for us for our ongoing operations. And then to the event or in the event that it does not necessarily match something that we, we want to do internally, we'll hedge it out in the market. But we are always the counterparty for your dual cryptocurrency notes. You want to explain the other side when you start off with US dollars? Definitely, yes. So let's just say you're a person that has $35,000 or, well, let's give the, given the price that we're at today, let's say you have $25,000, okay? And you want to buy one Bitcoin at $25,000. And that's, you want to wait until the price gets there to buy that Bitcoin. So what you can do is you can send your dollars or USDC to Ledin 
and you can enter into a DCN, a dollar to Bitcoin DCN. So on a dollar to Bitcoin DCN, you're going to have to select a date in the future on which you want to buy Bitcoin and the price in that day at which you want to buy Bitcoin. So similarly, you could choose the end of September and you can put $25,000 for your purchase of your Bitcoin. So, and for that commitment, you're going to get, say, $1,000. Let's just say for argument's sake, the yield for agreeing to this to this DCN will be $1,000. So you will sign up, you will put your $25,000 into the note and you will let time do its thing. When we get to the end of September, for argument's sake, let's just say Bitcoin is at $23,000. So that means that your price did reach. So instead of dollars, you're going to be getting one Bitcoin back at $25,000 plus the $1,000 uh, yield that you got for participating in those. So at the end, you would have a Bitcoin plus $1,000. Let's just say that the, at the end of September, the price of Bitcoin was still at $30,000. So your price did not reach. You're going to get back the same $25,000 plus the 1000 that you got for your yield. So you're now going to have $26,000. And you can basically try that again. Uh, and you can do it for a purchase price of 26 now that you have 26 And you can keep trying that uh, until you, you get the purchase. What people do in many, uh, many cases is, let's say they start with dollars at 25 They get the Bitcoin purchase that they wanted. So they bought their Bitcoin at 25 Then they turn around and they create a dollar to Bitcoin DCN with Bitcoin prices at 35 or 30 And so what that does is that you are buying Bitcoin at 25 You're setting up your purchase at 30 at the end of next month or at the end of the following month. So you're always planning to sell at the price you want and maximize the yield that you're getting in the process. And then if that gets, if that hits, then you turn right back around and you basically do another one on the dollar side to buy it again. So if, if you have a range or a desire to buy or sell in the future, this is a tool that is widely used in traditional finance. Um, many, many people make use of it. It's been, um, this type of product is very, very popular. So we, we're very excited to bring it now to the Bitcoin world. And how's the response been so far? The re response from clients, you mean? The, yeah. the feedback? It's been great. So we did a lot of these um, um, last year when we started offering this product. It was offered only to uh, uh, qualified investors and it was offered through private wealth, uh, to a private wealth representative. So it was, a, it was a bit of a manual process to get them set up, but people loved them. And it was due to the success that this product had in the private wealth uh, format that we bring it or we brought it into the platform and the uptake on the platform has been very very uh you know it's it's met and surpassed our expectations so far and it's only getting more popular so um i'm, I'm really excited to see what where this goes that's great any other exciting announcements they're very so that that you know these two products uh, that, that we've just launched as as long as our open book or as well as our open book report is i'm incredibly proud of our team you know, um, the fact that bear markets are for building, you know, we, yeah. we've always said that. And yeah. for us, the proof is in the pudding. You know, we've shipped more this year uh, in terms of products and updates, I think that we did in the first six months of last year. So, you know, our team is is moving faster um, and, and we're getting much more efficient. And I'm that's something that it's, I'm tremendously proud of. And to, to say that we are one of the firms in this industry that was able to get a, a a regulatory license uh so far this year it's it's something that again fills us with pride and i think is a testament to to Ledin's reputation and track record Ledin today still holds a perfectly clean track record with regulators worldwide we've not received any uh enforcement letters of any kind and that i think speaks to uh the level of care and thought that we put into these products uh and, and how we manage our risk absolutely as bitcoiners we are always rooting for uh, you know, companies like yours, and you should be proud. So that's fantastic. And you're talking about regulatory issues. What do you think of the uh, current SEC uh, stance and, you know, their approach to crypto in the US? Any comments around that? So I've written I've written a few blogs or essays on this. I, I write the, our biweekly research letter. If anybody wants to check it out, it's uh, uh, letter.io slash blog. My personal view on this is that you have seen... Um, they had to act after what happened with FTX, right? Like th that was a massive event. It happened in their backyard. They, they had to do something. Uh, the problem with that is that once they got ready to take action, most of the bad players had already taken people's money. 
And all that was left was a bunch of people that were A, being responsible, B, had a re resilient business because they went through everything and, and they were still standing by their client. And surprise, surprise, you know, the SEC decides to come with a heavy hand to to the likes of Coinbase, who is a, who is a group that has been clamoring for clarity uh, for the last two years. And so what I think happened is you started to see a couple of things. One, I think there was some sort of expectation that when the SEC went after these firms, that the rest of the world was going to kind of do the same. But what you saw was that they started coming after crypto companies. And, and literally within minutes, you had France, Hong Kong, El Salvador, the UAE, everybody saying, come to UK. us. Come to us. If you yeah. if you if you if you're having issues, come to us. Come to us. And all of a sudden, everybody started coming. You know, within weeks, you had uh, Gemini had announced their uh, uh, Singapore exchange. Co Coinbase had announced a Bermuda exchange. Coincidentally, we had been working on this for 18 months, but coincidentally, a regulatory approval came that same week. So within within a, a matter of a week, you had Coinbase, Led, and Gemini and others saying, "Hey, we have been granted licenses in different jurisdictions." And all of a sudden, you know, the, and then you had another big kind of, I, I want to say, hard to explain event, which was when the SEC tries to bring a, an exchange that they regulated in to give a public hearing with the, with the U.S. Congress or the U.S. Senate. And this, that there was an exchange by the name of Prometheus. And the, the, the hearing was just uh, completely backfired on the SEC because what, you know, the, you had Fortune the next day running headlines like, the SEC's only regulated exchange is a joke and everyone knows it. I'm actually quoting verbatim a headline from Fortune. So there's a lot of public backlash on what they were trying to do. And again, I find it a little bit surprising that since then, since that particular event, uh, that Prometheus hearing, the very next week you had BlackRock announce an ETF application with Coinbase as the custodian and the market surveillance partner. Um, and just for context, BlackRock does not get denied. BlackRock has applied 577 times for an ETF and they've gotten one rejection. So the industry in some ways saw this as a moment where they said, oh, MG, they're going to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF and everyone refiled their applications. So you, now you had Fidelity, 21 shares with uh, ARC. You know, every, by the way, the ARC decision might come this week. One, one update may come this week. So basically you had that. And then in that same week, the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell says that Bitcoin has, quote, staying power and that payment stable coins, they are starting to see as a form of money. And what I like to say about that is like there, there is not a single word that comes out of Jerome Powell's mouth that's accidental. So all of this was very, very planned. And now you are starting to see some of the some of the legal um uh, pen, uh, battles that the SEC had against groups within the crypto industry are starting to go against the SEC. You know, the, the Ripple decision happened last week. Now, Gary Gensler has started to sort of paint his his vote on the SEC as one of many, whereas in the past, you know, I think they're starting to sort of lay the ground for an eventual approval despite his public challenges uh, with, with agreeing to this application because he, he in the past has been very adamant that he didn't, that he has, he saw reasons why this should not happen. But slowly, it's just been, you know, the the things around him have been sort of caving in, and I think that's setting the stage for a potential approval of a BlackRock uh, spot ETF, uh, and that may even happen coincidentally very close to the next halving. So I think that's what's got a lot of Bitcoiners pretty op pretty optimistic uh, how things are progressing. Yeah, internally, do you think this this optimism, especially around the ETF, is reflected in the price? So. There, there's a there's a couple of contending battles or there, there's um, contending battles. There's, there's a couple of ba battling camps right now. There's there's one camp that says ETF is going to be approved. It's you know off, we're off to the races. Uh, you know green from here type of thing. And the the I think the only thing that's standing in the way of that is you know the ETF is is almost uh, a when not an if. In, in my books, uh, it, it may not be this month or next month or the next month, but it probably will happen within the next 12 months. You know, Bloomberg ETF analysts are giving it like 65% chances yeah. before the end of the year. So yes. um, I, 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 I tend to side somewhere with them. So the ETF approval is a bit of a matter of time. The the um, halving, we all know it's coming. 
And we all know what it's done to price in the past. So I think the only thing that's kind of standing, the kind of big elephant in the room is what happens with macro, right? Because you can have an ETF approval and you can have a halving, but if the whole world is going into a crisis, there's going to be not very many people excited to buy. So I think what people are trying to manage is the timing of these positive events for Bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the potential uh, more cowbell that the world is expecting when, when, when the economy starts faltering. Everybody's expecting rates to go back down and stimulus packages to get announced. Um, right now, I think we're getting one of the two. Because if you look at the deficits that the governments are running, like if you look at the deficits the U.S. government is running, they're running, they're planning a deficit of 1.5 trillion last year. To put it in context, the year where they've spent the most money, which was COVID, they ran a three trillion dollar deficit. So a completely normal year, which is next year, um, will have almost half all of the incentives or half of the losses. They're going to be running at only half of the loss than they did during COVID. So all their, the, the Chips Act, all these new infrastructure projects that they have, they have to finance with fresh cash. So right now you're pressing on the accelerator and the brakes at the same time. You have big, big deficits being done at very, very high interest rates. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to come to a head and there's an election year in the U.S. next year. And we know that politicians do not like to manufacture poverty uh, when they have to get reelected. So uh, again, what they are trying to do right now to curb down the economy is to manufacture poverty in the same way that to boost us out of COVID, they had to manufacture wealth. They, they just literally injected it into people's pockets. Right now, they have to flip it and like almost forcefully take it out of people's pockets. And the, the first part is great if you're trying to get elected. The second one does not get you elected at all. And this is why, you know, I, I joke about this often, but if you go and poor people around you, go go down the street and ask somebody if they want a new benefit program, uh, a new a new incentive, a new this. And everybody will say, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? Like, that seems like a good idea. But if you go and tell somebody, hey, we're going to cut this particular incentive uh, because it doesn't make sense, people immediately are going to be like, whoa, why are you going to cut it? Who, where's the money going to go? Like, where? how are you going to use this money to go somewhere else? So incentives are almost like a one-way street. You know, you, you can always get more of them, but taking them back is almost nearly impossible. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens to the sort of student loan debt debate. Um, there, there's a lot of things where the government can still do quantitative easing under the guise of not doing quantitative easing. But, um, but I think Bitcoin is just going to keep calling them out <laughs> on, on what these things really are. Yeah, it seems with all the things that you mentioned, that if not by the end of this year, that next year could be a perfect storm uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, I think, you know, my experience in Venezuela taught me that, you, you know, the Bitcoin is almost a, a, with Bitcoin, what you're saying is I want protection, whether governments make the right decisions or not, right? Like that you, you want to have uh, inflation protection, if they do well, or they want to have inflation protection if they don't make the right decisions. And in my experience, you know, it's when when you're running a business, the pressure to be liked, the pressure to be reelected is so high that it will usually trump a politician's will to do the right thing financially or to, to do the right fiscally responsible thing. Because when you're when you're a politician and you're trying to do the fiscally responsible thing, you know, that can go pretty quickly from, oh, you don't get reelected to you're getting death threats from everyone around you uh, for the next little bit. And so that's a bullet few people want to bite. Maurice, we are closing to one hour. I know you had a crazy morning, uh, a manic Monday morning. <laughs> and you're doing this on a public holiday, which you didn't realize on your calendar when you booked this date. So I'm going to let you go. It's always fascinating to talk to you. I think we built a great friendship after the first podcast. I know you've been taking care I have a personal uh, RM in Ledin, uh, you know, for my business with Ledin, which is fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much for doing that. Uh, thank you for coming on 21 Tasks. Before you go, how can people reach uh, you and reach Ledin for all the products that you mentioned announced today? Absolutely. So you can reach Ledin at Ledin.io is our website, L-E-D-N.io. Our social media is at HODL with Ledin. My personal social media is at Cryptonomist, cryptonomist with an A at the end. 
And um, yeah, so you can check out the Latin blog, which goes out once every two weeks. I I draft that newsletter, so you can subscribe at blog.letter.io if you want to check it out. Um, we are also going to be at Singapore at 20, Token 2049. If anyone listening is near there, let us know. Uh, We're going to be hitting uh, Thailand as well, uh, uh, Seoul in South Korea, and uh, Paris and Bogota. So if you're in any of those cities or close to those cities and would like to come together or connect with our team, please uh, ping us. You can also reach us at support at leaden.io and we'll be happy to give you more details and hopefully set up so we can meet. Super exciting, super exciting news, super exciting announcement. Uh, announcements, Mauricio, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, it's a pleasure, Sandeep.